I'm Landon Schott, and this is Spiritual Leadership, where we're helping leaders become spiritual leaders. Today, I'll be exposing the three false gods that make up what I call the dark trinity. Who are they? Where do they come from? And how can you see their influence in our society today? During this episode, you may discover that you could be worshiping or you could be engaging with the false god and you didn't even know it. I'll also be answering questions about the dark trinity and spiritual warfare and having conversations on how these demonic forces have impacted our culture. So let's get after it. So today we're really talking about spiritual warfare. So what is spiritual warfare? Let me give you a definition. Spiritual warfare is spiritual opposition to the will of God through the help of evil spirits. So just like the Holy Spirit helps us fulfill the perfect will of God in our lives, spiritual warfare is when demonic spirits are opposing God's perfect will. This is usually the time that many maybe uh, carnal Christians or immature Christians would say something like, well, uh, spiritual warfare, I don't want to be over spiritual. Let me just stop you for a second. Okay, so let me get this straight. You're watching the Spiritual Leadership Podcast. There's a good chance that you identify or call yourself a Christian. What do we mean? You follow Jesus. What does it mean to follow Jesus? It means you put your faith in him. So, you know, with a few theological differences, you believe that a virgin girl gave birth to God, impregnated by the Holy Spirit, never had sex with anybody before, but God impregnated her. She gave birth to a sinless Savior who walked the earth for 33 years, never sinned, died on the cross for our sins, rose from the dead, ascended to heaven, and one day is coming back for you and I. You believe that, but you don't want to be over spiritual. Does that make sense to you? It doesn't make sense to me either because the enemy has lulled us to sleep. And really what people are saying when they say, I don't want to be over spiritual is they're saying, I want to remain carnal or I want to remain spiritually immature and I want to help you spiritually grow. I want you to become a spiritual leader. So that means we have to grow in our understanding of spiritual warfare. So how do we win or lose spiritual warfare? Let me make it really simple for you. When you obey God, you win in spiritual warfare. When you disobey God is when you lose in spiritual warfare. Ephesians 6, 12 tells us this, that we don't wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the rulers or principalities, high-ranking demons, against the authorities, against cosmic powers over this present darkness, or against spiritual forces of evil in heavenly places. What is the scripture saying? It's saying this, that there's an unseen spiritual world, There is a good and evil, and most of the time we don't see it because the enemy wants to be stealth and he wants to be unseen, but something is shifting and changing. I mean, I grew up in a charismatic Pentecostal church, and you know, I heard people talking, Jesus is coming tomorrow, and he's coming any day, and I remember thinking, yeah, yeah, right, like, you know, not maybe my great, great, great grandchildren's lifetime, like this not happening anytime soon, and then COVID happened. And then we went from zero to 10 on the crazy scale really fast. Romans 1 began to happen before our eyes. I mean, it is insanity what we're living in today. And all of a sudden, I was like, whoa, we might be closer to the return of Christ than I thought. And the main thing that got me thinking, hey, I think I think Jesus' return is closer than I originally thought, was how visible evil has become, how visible demonic forces have become. So they're not hiding in the shadows any longer. They are presenting themselves on the main stage of society. And I want to show you the three false gods that are presenting themselves in society and in culture today. The first is the God we call Baal, the false God who's known as the possessor. Possessor. Baal worship was the primary idolatry of the Bible. What do I mean by idolatry? It's a man-made God. It's worshiping anything but Yahweh, anything but the one true God. And even in the Ten Commandments, the first two commandments was don't have any gods before me and don't make for yourself any idols. This is pointing to Baal. So Baal was the chief deity or the false god of the ancient world. So the Phoenicians, the Canaanites, the Babylonians, the Assyrians, and his image was the bull. So you need to be 
mindful that when we see the image in our day in culture and society, that that's where it's stemming from. So Baal was con connected with almost all ancient people in some way, shape, or form. Even when you see like demonic movies or horror movies, there's always something to do with the bull or points to that because it's this imagery of this ancient God. So he was the primary God of idolatry. Baal was known as the storm god. He was the bringer of rain. So Baal was recognized as the sustaining of fertility of all crops, animals, and people. So his followers often believed that when they performed foul sexual acts in his temple, that it would boost Baal's sexual prowess and he would contribute to their work at increased fertility. So the more perverted sexual acts they did in the name of Baal, the more fertile their land would be. This is why it was such an absolute act of spiritual war when the prophet Elijah said there will be no rain in the land because what he was saying was your God has no power. That's why that scenario in first Kings was so intense. So Baal worship is the ultimate form of self-worship. It's a rejection of God, his purity. So when we call Yahweh our master or a husband, the Bible has all of these um, uh, analogies that we are the bride of Christ, like Ephesians chapter five. So Baal worship is a rejection or a divorce of being the bride of Christ, and now you're worshiping a new husband or a new possessor named Baal. His visual appearance first came on the form in Exodus. The reason why it's a bull is we see in Exodus 32, you know the story. Moses goes up the mountain, he's meeting with God, fasting for 40 days, and he comes back, and Aaron and the people got tired of waiting on God, so they made their own God. And it says in verse four that he just, Aaron said, I just threw in some gold and out came this calf or Baal. This was the largest worship service in Israel's history that the entire nation turns its back on God and begins to worship Baal. Now, this is very interesting. I think it's interesting that when Moses goes up the mountain to get God's word or to meet with God, the enemy comes in and opposes God's word. Watch. As God is writing with his finger, don't have any other gods before me. Don't make any idols. It's exactly what those the people, God's people, the children of Israel are doing while God is writing it because this is a strategy of the enemy. The enemy is always going to strategically come against what God tells us to do, his ways, his laws, and his purpose. Okay, so through Baal worship, there's more to this, came all sorts of erotic acts of perverted heterosexual relationships, homosexual relationships, violent sexual acts, body piercing with genitals. They would cut themselves. They had this infatuation with blood, drinking and draining, prostitution and ceremonial orgies. This is foul. So imagine if you took a brothel and a Planned Parenthood, mixed them together. That's what you would have with a Baal Baal's temple. Okay. So Baal worship was this constant temptation for the Israelites. And it was actually the most in heightened when a king or a government leader endorsed it. So we see this in first Kings chapter 16. This is one of the biggest um, uh, confrontations that, that the people of God had with Baal. And it's the story of, again, Elijah confronting King Ahab and Jezebel. So here's what happened is that King Ahab married Jezebel and directly align God's people with God's enemy. Not only did he do that, then he started building temples of Baal all over Israel so they would begin to worship the enemy. This is what's happening in our world today, because when the government begins to promote Baal worship, the people of God quickly compromise and fall away from worshiping the one true God. So what does Baal worship look like today? I'm so glad you asked. We have divorced ourselves from the one true God, and we've created an idolatry, and now we are worshiping self, prosperity, and success. We have a, a bull statue that looks like Baal that was sits in front of the New York uh, financial district, and it's a sign of success and power. We worship how the government tells us to worship. When the government says, no, you can't worship, you can't sing, you can't gather, you have to shut down, uh, and, and, and because there is a pandemic or because there's something going on here that that, that, that we're, we're creating rules, creating laws, we're doing unconstitutional thing, and what did the church do? The church shut down during COVID, and we said, okay, we're going to do what the government tells us to do. 
and we're not going to worship. And it's okay. Why? Because Baal worship was being promoted. At the same time, businesses were still allowed to thrive. They still worship prosperity. They still worship popularity. We are seeing this success and money that we are chasing called Baal worship. The second God I want to introduce you to is what we call Ishtar. Ishtar was the God of perverted sexuality. In ancient myology, they believed that Baal's wife was Ishtar. Ishtar is also referred to as Ashtar, Aphrodite, Venus, Juno, or some even say the spirit of Jezebel. She was a goddess of prostitutes. From Ishtar, we get the word porne. Porne is the illustration of the prostitutes. I know you're, you're coming with me on this. So this is where we actually get our word porn from. And in ancient writings, we see these clay statues of naked women. We actually get the word erotic from the Greek word eros or ishtar in Greek form. So she would erect these ashra poles of, of pornography as images to worship. She was known as the one that dwells in taverns. So watch this. You know the story of Jonah the whale in Jonah one through four, God sends Jonah to a city called Nineveh. He tells them to repent because judgment's coming. Now, this is interesting because every time God intends mercy, he always tells us to preach repentance or judgments because he intends mercy. So even when people are, are preaching judgment and calling people to repentance, it's really a message of mercy because that's God's heart. But guess what? This city that God was going to judge and destroy in Nineveh, that they actually repented. Do you know who their God was? It was Ishtar. She was the drunken god of perversion of Nineveh. She was a witch. Her sex was her worship. They would dance and cut themselves. Her sexuality breaks conventional lines. It bends sexual lines. It was this ever rampant, changing sexuality. She was called the goddess of war, and her war was on purity and holiness. Ishtar mimics the Holy Spirit. She's the unholy spirit. In some ancient writings, she identifies, watch this, as a man and a woman. And she has the power to turn men into women and women into men. So watch, she was the priest of transitioning. Get this, her illustrations or her colors were the colors of the rainbows in ancient writings. Ishtar worshiped various manifestations. Her cult often included ritual prostitution in erratic prophecy, according to 1 Kings chapter 18. Even in Babylon, Nebuchadnezzar II erected this elaborate gate in her honor, making the end of a sacred processional route called the processional or the parade or the dance of Ishtar. This is wild. The second century Roman writer Apuleius wrote about a goddess parade where men wear soft clothes, eyeliner, and heavily exaggerated makeup or what we call as drag queens. Guys, it gets crazier. She requires not one day, but an entire month of celebrating her sexuality. This month of public sexual worship was known as Junium that St. Jerome identified as the month of June, and she claimed the entire month to take her own possession of the culture, because here's what happens. When she controls the culture, she controls the next generation. Y'all, Ishtar worship today has taken over society. They call it a sexual revolution that started in the 1960s. America is the number one consumer of pornography in the world. The dance of Ishtar is what we call Pride Month, where they fill the streets, paint roads as rainbow colors. We've literally replaced the cross in America with rainbows. We've plastered it all over our White Houses and all over uh, government monuments. States, uh, capitals hang in wave the rainbow flag because the logo has become an identity. Men dress up like women and parade in the streets. They're not in parks and bars anymore. They're in schools and churches and in public places. Women are celebrated as being masculine and masculinity of men is now called toxic. Women performers are vulgar and dominant as male performers are soft and effeminate. Sex is no longer biological. We've now made it fluid. We've created a social construct. And now we don't even follow science anymore. We manipulate science and we call it Ishtar worship. This is what modern Ishtar worship looks like. And America is worshiping this false god of Ishtar. You just saw it as a sexual revolution or as pride.
The third God I want to talk about, and maybe even the most offensive God in our society, is the God of Molech, or the God of child sacrifice, or you may know it as the God of abortion. Molech, Moloch, or Milcom was this God of murder and the originator of child sacrifice. So watch, this God demanded to be worshiped through the sacrifice of children. We see in Leviticus chapter 20, verse two, it says this, so tell the people of Israel, none of them or any of the Israels or the strangers who sojourn or visit the land who gives any of his children to Molech shall be put to death. God was warning his people in Leviticus, as you're coming into the promised land, you cannot associate with any of these nations that worship Molech through child sojourn. uh, 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 sacrifice. So watch this. Molech occurs eight times in the Old Testament and in the New, and one time in the New Testament. Molech is found in the context of cultic child sacrifices. And particularly it uses the phrase to cause one's sons or daughters to pass over or by the fire unto Moloch. So watch, Moloch would demand that parents would bring their children to an altar and lay the children on the altar and burn the children alive in worship to Moloch. See, it wasn't safe for any kids in the ancient world, and they could be disregarded at any time. There was this massive disrespect for life. This happened with the children of Israel in Egypt. It happened with Jesus uh, in the New Testament when Herod was killing the New Testament boys. And watch this, Moloch tries to mimic Jesus in a perverted, foul, evil way. So instead of Jesus laying down his life, Molech takes life. This is important you understand this, that the worship of Ishtar and Molech is sex and child sacrifice. And when you worship sex, you have to sacrifice your children. So how do we see Moloch visible today? Well, abortion is absolutely modern day child sacrifice. It is Baal worship. I wanna say this again, because I know there's some of you that you love God, but you're not a spiritual leader yet. Why? You're letting the world lead you rather than the Holy Spirit lead you. And so you're not growing in your spiritual leadership because you think according to the foundations, the fabric, or the lenses of the world. So all throughout the Bible, God talks about child sacrifice from the womb out. And over and over, he demands that we don't do it. He calls us to repentance of it. This is why uh, uh, Jeremiah was the weeping prophet because he saw the Valley of Bones. What was the Valley of Bones? It was the place where they offered all of the babies to Ishtar, or or, or, excuse me, Molech, where they saw the baby's bones in the body. This is why God brought uh, judgment to Israel. This is why they got taken in captivity because they worshiped Molech. Moloch, and this is so important because the church cannot keep worshiping Moloch and aborting babies and think that God is going to bless us. America now demands abortion and abortion on to man. The Supreme Court in New York made this tribute for abortion of the goddess Medusa, and in, it stands where the people go for justice. We have sacrificed over 70 million babies on this altar of Moloch, and now we've embraced it as normal. Normal. Abortion has become a normal thing. Child sacrifice has become a normal thing in America because it's the new form of worship. Okay, so let's recap right now. We have Baal, Molech, and Ishtar. We have a God of pleasure, a God of the world, a God of abortion and sexual perversion. The reason why I call it the dark trinity is because it mocks and mimics the trinity of God. So Baal is the mimicking of God the Father. He's a false god of idolatry. Moloch mimics Jesus. Again, instead of Jesus laying down his life to save us, Moloch takes life. And Ishtar mimics the Holy Spirit and mocks the Holy Spirit, where the Holy Spirit is holy and Ishtar is the un. Holy Spirit. Okay, so now I've described it to you. This is what's going on. It's gone from in the shadows of dark demons to now the public stage of culture. So what does this really look like today? How do you know if you are worshiping a false God or that you have entertained a demonic principality in your life? And here's what I would tell you. When you're in sexual sin, when you're in sin outside of biblical marriage, 
when you're addicted to porne of Ishtar or pornography, when you've affirmed this new gender affirming manipulation transgender world, when you have said that that is normal, when you've begin to affirm that, when you begin to celebrate sin, celebrate evil, when you begin to compromise with God's word and God's standards, and you begin to give your life and your resources to others. How about this? When you finance it, do you know that when we shop at major stores like Target and Starbucks and, and, and go to these other stores, they're actually supporting perversion. They're supporting gay and lesbians' rights and awareness. They're supporting abortion. I had to cancel my credit card because I was with Chase Bank, and Chase Bank is paying for people to go out of state to have abortions, and they're paying for it. So I can't use business with someone that is worshiping a false god. Now, some would say, oh, that's too far, and, and where do we draw the line? And I would say that th these are the hills that we die on. This is the Ten Commandments. This is the choose this day who you're going to serve. Are you going to be a spiritual leader or are you gonna allow demonic forces to influence you and lead you? And I'm not saying that you have to have all my convictions. And I'm not saying that you can't drink coffee from a certain place. What I am saying is you have to have the desire to serve God with everything in you, where you love what he loves and hates what he hates. And what will happen is you will stay in the state of maturity that you're in. You won't spiritually grow. You won't begin to spiritually lead if you cannot lead spiritually through spiritual warfare. And spiritual warfare is real. And if we want to acknowledge it or not, it is there, and we are seeing it take place before our very eyes. So I want to challenge you. What part of your life is sympathetic, maybe worships, maybe engages, maybe financially supports Ishtar, Molech, or Baal? I think it's wild that you have all of these companies giving billions and billions of dollars to the sexual perversion, and the church struggles to even honor God in their tithe. I want to really challenge you today. Seek the Lord. Self-reflect. Look at your own life. What are you addicted to? What are you financing? What are you worshiping? What are you giving your time to? What do you think about? Do you think about the success and the love of the world more than you think about Jesus, loving him, pleasing him, building his kingdom? Are you addicted? Do you think about the lusts of the world more than the holiness of God? And have you compromised where you've believed the lies and the talking points of the world, that it's your body, your choice, it's a clump of cells, it's not really a baby, or do you understand that you were formed in your mother's womb and that John the Baptist was baptized in the Holy Spirit from womb before he was even born? When the world calls a clump of cells, the Holy Spirit had filled John the Baptist in the womb. This is where you must break out of your cultural mindset and you must have a biblical worldview. Everything in me, I want you to spiritually grow. I want to help you. I want to mentor you. I want to disciple you. But that means this. You have to start living according to God's word and not the culture. Can I pray for you today? So, Lord, I pray right now that scales would begin to fall off our eyes. And like Moses said, like Elijah said, choose this day who you're going to serve or who's on the Lord's side. Lord, I pray that there would just be this passion in your people to not serve, worship, or associate with these false gods that they would be loyal to you. Lord, I pray you would give them eyes to see, ears to hear, hearts to receive what your spirit is showing them. I pray you would protect them, lead them, guide them. And Lord, all those that pursue you with everything in, I pray, God, that you would cause them to spiritually grow. I bless my friends in Jesus' name. We declare, speak, Lord. Your servants are listening. Amen. There is one way to God, and it's through Jesus. But in Jesus, there are many ways to connect with him. You can commune with him while creating, denying your flesh and feeding your spirit, ministering to his heart through worship, meditating on scripture, getting alone to be with him, meeting with him in creation, asking him questions and listening for his response, learning something new about him, moving into an encounter with him, making the crooked ways straight, serving his people, remembering what he has done. Your daily encounters with God change everything. 
Discover how you connect with God. Text ENCOUNTER to 59090 today. I love doing Q&A because Q&A helps reflect or give insight on people's spiritual maturity and spiritual growth. You know, I've said before, uh, you know, some people say there's no such thing as a dumb question and surely they haven't done Q&A because I get dumb questions all the time. And I'm being funny, but like, what do you mean by a dumb question? Well, I, I'll say something like, you can't be a gay Christian because you can't put anything between you and the cross. It becomes idolatry. There's no biblical references to anything like a gay Christian. And then, you know, some people respond and be like, well, you have titles in your name like pastor and husband and father. So isn't that the same thing? Like, no, that's a really dumb thing. Like, no, that doesn't relate at all whatsoever. It's not coming in front of my Christianity. I'm a father. I'm a husband. I'm a pastor, uh, but I'm a Christ follower first and nothing comes before that. So that reflects someone's immature ability to understand. But at the same time, as people ask good questions or strategic questions, it means, hey, they've been spending time with the Lord. They've been spending time with the Holy Spirit. And so they're thinking new thoughts before. So today I have some great questions, not some dumb ones or lame ones. So I want to get to those today. So here's some of the questions that were submitted. First question, I love this question. Just like there is a fruit of the Holy Spirit, what is the fruit of the dark trinity? So I would say this, the enemy always does what is opposite. So if God is love, the enemy is hateful. If God is light, the enemy is darkness. If God is good, the enemy is evil. And so you would see the opposite of the fruit of the Spirit. So Galatians tells us what the fruit of the Spirit is. So when the fruit of the Spirit is love, the fruit of the dark trinity would be hate or being hateful. When you have joy as a fruit of the Spirit, then the opposite would be anger. When the fruit of the Spirit is peace, the opposite of that would be anxiety or fear. When the fruit of the Spirit is patience, the opposite would be being rushed or forced or your inability to wait on the Lord. You would have feet that are quick to rush into evil. When a fruit is kindness, the opposite would be strife. When a fruit is faithfulness, the opposite would be you're unsubmitted. There's nowhere that you're accountable to. You're not faithful to what God tells you to do. You're unfaithful with his word. You're unfaithful in service. You're unfaithful in his house. So when a fruit would be gentleness, the opposite would be you're harsh, you're unkind, you're mean-spirited. When the fruit of the Spirit would be self-control, you would have a lawlessness to you. There would be nothing that controlled. You would, you would do impulsively what the seductions or the temptations of the world would be. So this is a great question. So I'd say when you're looking at what the enemy would do or what the fruit of that would be, look to the opposite. So how are Christians partnering with the dark trinity and they don't even know it? I love this question. See, you worship what you give your attention to. So whatever you are obsessed with, whatever you are thinking the most about, whatever you're giving your time to, whatever you're giving your money to, there's a song I listen to quite a bit, and one of the lines in it are, you're the first thing I think of when I wake up and the last thing I think about when I go to bed. And I'm always conscious about what am I thinking about? And are you obsessed with the things of God? Are you obsessed with His will? Are you obsessed with pleasing Him? Are you obsessed with knowing Him? Or do you obsess about making more money, buying stuff? Do you get captivated by the things of the world? Do you get on social media and get drawn into perverted images and things and find yourself in lustful atmospheres? What are you obsessed with? What are you consumed with? Because you worship the thing that you give your attention to. How can you have conversations about the dark trinity with your children? Great question and a little intense. So I would say this. As I teach on spiritual warfare, I use this term called unseating principalities. And unseating principalities is, is simply this. You're taking your focus off of the demonic force and onto what we call the highest power. Or you focus on Jesus. He is the highest authority. So when Baal worship is self-pleasure or self-worship, you would teach your children about pleasing the Lord. When Moloch worship is the God of child sacrifice. You teach your children about how much God loves children, how he focuses on life, that God knows us when we're in our womb, that from the beginning of time, John the Baptist was filled with the Holy Spirit. God's got a plan and purpose. He hates hands that shed innocent blood. So you focus on how much God loves children. Remember when the children came to Jesus? That's his heart for children. And then Ishtar is the God of perverted unholiness. Then you teach them about holiness. You teach them well, what it means to be 
be set apart, how mommies treat daddies, how daddies treat mommies, how we honor one another. So here's what I'm telling you. As children, you are teaching them the ways of God. By doing that, when they start seeing the principalities, when they start seeing the dark trinity, when they start seeing perversion, they will know right from wrong because you've already taught them very well. What are the ways you can spot tolerance or acceptance to the dark trinity? This is really an easy one. You're looking for carnality and worldliness. You're looking at when people look more like the world than they do God, his word, Jesus, the fruit of the spirit. And so you'll see what I call carnal Christians or pretend Christians, where they pretend they love God. They they, they go to church occasionally. They're involved in church community. They like worship music, but they're not living a dedicated life that follows Jesus, or they are carnal. They, they've made compromises. They're living in sin with their boyfriend and girlfriend. They don't to hold a high standard of God's word. They think God's word is just good advice and really not God's holy word. They've lowered the standards. They celebrate perversion. They 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 make compromises. They they try to affirm sin and perversion. So here's it: is there's a carnality and a worldliness? You know that they've already tolerated, accepted, and on their way to celebrating what isn't godly, what isn't holy, and what is the dark trinity. How can I spiritually lead and expose the work of the dark trinity in people, in situations, or in circumstances around me? And here's what I would tell you to do. Begin to call it out. Begin to expose it. Begin to show people how their current lifestyle, what they celebrate, what they affirm, what they endorse, how it conflicts with the word of God. Show them when they celebrate pride that God's word says, I oppose the proud. When they say they were born that way, that God's word says, well, you must be born again. Show them how what they say, what they believe, or their make for themselves lukewarm Christianity opposes scripture. And you could do this in love and you could do it in kindness. But here's what I've learned. It doesn't matter how kind you are, how loving you are. When people hate to hear it, they will call it hate speech. They will flag you. They will censure you. They will try to stop you. They will try to insult you. They will try to persecute you. They will try to silence you. And so in love, call it out. And I had someone recently say, well, you know, if you use scriptures that are too intense, you should really say it like, you know, like a friend would tell someone, like a helpful friend. And uh, my response is, that's probably how Satan sounded when he was tempting Jesus using scripture. You know, look how Jesus talked to his disciples. Get behind me, Satan. You're an offense unto me. Are you going to leave too when people got offended? Like there was a, a beautiful honesty and intensity that Jesus had. He told people, burn the plow. Who's your father? Who's your mother? Come and follow me. And there comes a time where you got to be faithful in your love for God, your love for God's word, in your obedience to him. So I'd say in kindness, call it out. Amazing questions. I love hearing these questions from spiritual leaders. And if you have a question you would like me to answer on this podcast, then just text podcast to 59090. Some topics of spiritual leadership need a little more insight. They need experience. So I want to sit down and learn from someone who's experienced these dark spirits from the dark trinity on a daily basis in practical ways. Today, I have State Representative Nate Schatzlein, who is a personal friend, uh, founder of For Liberty and Justice, a pastor at Mercy Culture Church, and like I said, a state rep here in Texas. So Nate, you are actively involved in the political realm, and which is a spiritual warfare realm. Yes. And so you are experiencing this stuff on a daily basis. How do you see this dark trinity on a daily basis within politics? So I think there's two parts. We see it in legislation, these spirits, but we also see it in the good guys and in the bad guys on the Texas House floor and all throughout the legislature. So the way I've seen bail work uh, is all throughout scripture, um, bail will plant seeds of doubt of who is responsible for success. It's interesting. And so like we see bail operating as early as Genesis chapter, uh, I think it's chapter one or chapter two, where, where all of a sudden this serpent comes in and tries to redefine who is good. Yeah. And what's so wild is Baal has not been named yet in scripture. Yep. And yet he's trying to get Adam and Eve, Eve specifically, to redefine who's responsible for the goodness in this garden. 
And I see that on the Texas House floor consistently. The biggest attack, because we could talk all day about those who want to mutilate children and and believe in abortion on demand. Obviously, they're operating in bail. They're completely owned by it, and they're unapologetic about it. But I'm more interested in the Republican side, those that claim to value life, forgetting that it was God who placed them in that seat. And when you forget that God placed you in the seat, you start to take ownership of it. Uh, which is where we see Aaron in the Bible do the same thing. While Moses, there's no, there's no coincidence that while Moses is writing the law, Aaron is undermining him and convincing the Israelites really good. that he is taking credit. Look, guys, we found our way out of Egypt. While Aaron is undermining him and teaching them to worship the false god, gods of self, Moses is seeking the Lord for the law. This is a picture of what happens on the Texas House floor is that there is a select group of individuals who are seeking the Lord for what God wants for the state of Texas. And this is everywhere. I mean, Congress, U.S. And then there's a select group that claim to fight for Christian values that have forgotten that God got them there. So they no longer rely on God for wisdom at all. Yeah, we're not waiting for the Lord anymore. We're not waiting for the Ten Commandments. We're not waiting no. for Moses. We could do this without him. I see this in a high level with those who have bought into this idea that they are beholden to donors, special interest groups, um, people who they believe got them there. And the beginning of the end of your favor with God in the political realm is believing that a donor, special interest group, or yourself puts you into a position of authority. That's good. And this is where we see that spirit operate on a high level. So really it comes down to like, choose this day who you're going to serve. Yes. Like, are you, are you working for special interests? Are you working for people's opinions? Or are you trying to please the Lord? And we see this in the church world too. It's interesting. You mentioned Aaron and Moses. So you have the children of Israel, which is the family of God. Yeah. You have one group that's siding with Moses and another group that is, is siding with Aaron. We're seeing this just construct right now this this separation in the church because there's we we call all people that talk about Jesus and, and sing songs churches but a lot of them aren't churches they're activist groups yes you know they are political activist groups they are uh, working an agenda we're seeing this huge in the gospel community yeah where you're having gospel music artists come out and support for demonic political candidates demonic yeah. agendas and they're doing it in the name of Christ we saw this when they tried to anoint Kamala Harris as the next Esther. Yeah. Yeah. Which is wild because oh, the church sick. the church doing it is like an anti-Israel pro-Palestinian yeah. <laughs> ministry. And then they're using Esther, uh, who is the deliverer of the Jews, yeah. as an example. Yeah. So it shows that you can be close to the things of God, like you said Aaron was, but far from it. Another aspect of it is uh, this Baal worship really turns the government into God. Yes. And what I mean by that is they look to the government for answers, the government for protection, the government for provision, and become so reliant on the government yeah. rather than reliant on God. I think that's one of the clearest ways that that this dark trinity or Baal worship infiltrates the people of God. How have you seen that from your vantage point within government? So the reality is, is I could... It's the easiest thing in the world to go and vote for conservative values and get reelected over and over and over and over again. Um, in fact, it's pretty simple. If you have a Republican district like I do as a politician, that if you follow the laws of populism, conservative populism, uh, you're not going to be challenged and you're not going to lose. It's only a threat when you can't be controlled. It's good. And the the challenge for a believer cuz like even talking about the church right that uh is celebrating abortion and and is pro palestinian those aren't churches by the way right, those right, are the activist cults, cults. The cults yeah. yeah so even pushing those aside because those are so obvious and in your face coming back to like there is a cultish type style movement that refuses individual thought and does not allow conservatives to think for themselves. And what that makes room for is corruption. So we'll be on the House floor. And about that time, we'll have a bill that no one understands why we as a group are supporting it. And I will watch this group think take place on the floor where one person will kind of 
in a meeting raise their hand and be like, hey, this uh, this doesn't seem like we as a body should endorse this. And the response will be, hey, uh, this is above your head. Understand, let's fall into line, not the hill to die on. Yeah, the intimidation factor. And that spirit is Jezebel. And if you allow that spirit in one time, it's over. And I have this policy that drives Republicans and Democrats crazy that when they're trying to get me to commit on a bill, if I haven't fully read it or if I haven't developed an opinion on it yet, more more what I'm actually saying, if I haven't brought it to the Lord yet, then I won't give them an answer. It could be the most obvious thing in the world. And they're like, are you going to support this? And my response will be, I still have to pray about it. It's awesome. It drives them insane. And the funniest part is- Which if you're a Christian, why would you ever be upset when someone's like, hey, let me pray about this? Because they don't want your loyalty to be to the Lord. They want your loyalty to be to a party. That's good. And so when your loyalty outweighs your conviction for a party platform, there's something that rubs them the wrong way with that because they realize, oh, if his loyalty is the Lord, no man can control him. And remember, when we're talking about bail, that word bail means possessor. Yes. Like it literally wants to possess and be controlled and want loyalty. Yes. So the bail worship is kind of the, the the subtle that people don't realize, ah, I'm making this my God instead of Jesus. Now, when you get into Ishtar and Molech, it becomes way more obvious. It should be actually. Yeah. It's not for others. But it, it is not just coincidental that the world has turned rainbow. Yeah. That it's now Juniism or, or June is Pride Month. Yeah. It's not just Pride Month. They're, they want it to be Pride Eternity. I mean, there's national coming out days, this day, that day. I mean, I, I go to Austin, every other, t other trip I'm there, yeah. there's rainbows everywhere. I'm like, it's not even June. And and it's not, it's the new normal. Yeah. And how come it's so widely accepted within the political realm? So I see, I see it happening in the church. I see uh, lukewarm, false yeah. teachers, false prophets, uh, synagogue of Satan, doctrine of demons. Like I've seen that, that, that aspect of it. And then, but in your world, yeah. even from the spiritual side, even there's the common sense side of things. I mean, I, I was with you in Austin when we're battling SB 14, yeah. which is doing sex changes on minors and one Democrat voted against it. Yeah. Every Democrat was for sex changes on minors except one. How has this infiltrated government so deep yeah. that perversion is so widely accepted? So I want to tell a story that has to do with it because SB 14, I, I was like, when I was preparing to talk to you in this conversation, I felt like the Lord brought the story of SB 14 to my heart. Um, not as a celebration, uh, but as a correction moment for me. So like full authenticity. We're on the floor for SB 14, and we've seen as Ishtar has made its way into Republicans' lives as well as Democrats' lives. And the reality is the goal of Ishtar is if you're either going to publicly celebrate debauchery or I think Ishtar knows if they can get conservative Christians to privately engage in debauchery, wow. it'll take their voice away from publicly fighting it. That's so good, Nate. So I'm like in the middle of the House floor and SB 14 is coming up. And I woke up that morning with a battle cry in my heart. I mean, I'm like praying in tongues in my condo. Like, Lord, you're going to give me words to say. You're going to give me things to defeat the enemy. And more than anything, when you're talking on the House floor— uh, you're not really talking to the members. If you've been there, it's kind of like a, uh, it's not like a courtroom. It's like a New York Stock Exchange. I mean, it's just chaos happening in the room. So when you're talking, you know you're talking to a, a, a mic system that's going back to your constituents back home. And I had this thought, I was like, Lord, you're gonna use me today to speak truth. Well, I got into the House floor and I realized very quickly for the third time, they were Democrats were gonna call a point of order and just structurally kill the bill. And we have such a weak speaker who's a Republican that just has absolutely no conviction whatsoever that I knew that Dade Phelan was gonna uphold this point of order and it was gonna die on the floor. And Which for, so people understand point of orders are legal objections to remove what you're talking about, basically to either kill it or delay it. And they can be ticky tacky. It can be like, oh, the background doesn't quite match the wording of your first paragraph within the bill. It's silly stuff, um, but it's procedural and we have to get it right for the law. And so if there's any mistake made, well, I knew they were gonna find something because the Democrats have hired five-star attorneys to vet these bills and find the tiniest little thing to kill it. And so we come in knowing 
that we're going to lose unless we have something spiritual uh, that that takes over. And so I had this idea when we walked into the Texas house, we have this thing called the local and consent calendar that comes before our normal bills of the day. That local and consent calendar, quick definition, all your local bills, renaming of roads, uh, getting a little grant for you to have, uh, you know, a new hospital district, that kind of thing. They're very non-controversial bills, which is why they come up and we vote for them as a slate, like all together. And the problem is there is a procedure where five legislators, this is unheard of, but five legislators can sign a piece of paper and kill a local and consent bill that someone has worked on all year. And so I went to the front and I asked for 25 kill pieces of paper, and I got five bold legislators that were willing to kill the first 25 local and consent bills of Democrats to threaten them to not mess with, us, uh, with, with our bill to end child gender mutilation. So we sign it. And I go up there and they start reading off Representative Nate Schatzlein, Representative Brian Harrison, Representative Steve Toth have signed this so that HB 1407 is, is sent back to committee. Democrats losing their mind. So they rush up to the front. Nate, how these these are local bills. We're going to kill every bill you've got. And I was like, jokes on you. The speaker hates me. I don't have any bills. <laughs> and so, so I'm sitting there and I'm like, I'm going to continue to kill them. And so people, even Republicans are like, Nate, this is volatile. This, and I go, do you want to rescue minors or do you not care about the future generation of Texans? And so we keep killing them. And finally, the Democrats concede and they're like, we will not call a point of order on that bill if you stop killing our bills. And I was like, deal. The secondary one is where I was convicted in my prayer time this morning. I, it was the first time I was praying about this morning. I'm like, Lord, this is the first time I felt conviction over this. We ended up passing the bill, but the deal that was made, I recognize was conceding to the enemy and the spirit of Ishtar. Mm. The deal that we made was, this is what the Democrats wanted. They said, we will let you pass your bill, but Nate, you can't talk about it. You're going to let us get our segments to post on our social media. You can't be on the mic. Tony Tenderholt, Brian Harrison, y'all can't speak about it, but we'll let you pass your bill. And the Holy Spirit convicted me today and was like, you let Ishtar silence the voice I gave you wow. to concede. Wow. And though the bill was passed, we, and this is an authentic moment for me, missed a moment to show the boldness of the Lord. We don't negotiate with spiritual terrorists. It's funny that you say this. I'm reminded as you're talking of Moses and Pharaoh. And Pharaoh says, okay, you can go. You just have to leave your sacrifices your points of worship. You can go. It's just this negotiation he had constantly yeah. of you can leave Egypt, but you just can't really worship the Lord like you want to do and literally try to silence their worship yeah. as they're leading Egypt. And the gods of Egypt were the gods of Baal, Ishtar, Ashtra, Molech. It was the similar gods. It was those similar false gods where it's always trying to silence the voice of the people of God. We're seeing this over and over and over. Uh, and, and one of the things is, is with child sacrifice, which we call abortion, yeah, which is wild. Like the entire presidential election was hanging on this one thing of abortion. It's, yeah. it's what the, the, athletes in Hollywood, what everyone talks about. Why do you want to vote for Kamala? Why do you want to vote for Democrats? It's the woman's right to choose mm. child sacrifice. Yeah. And it should be just an absolute no brainer. Um, but it's not, you see, it, it, it blows my mind. I, I, I did a post recently, you know, you'll have a, a black person that's either mistreated by the police or the court system. And I mean, the world goes into an uproar. Yep. Unless that black person was thrown into prison for peacefully protesting against an abortion clinic. The hypocrisy. And then all of a sudden, oh, they deserve, they got what they deserved. I'm like, this is insane Yes, where our nation has come to. And this is a moment where the church has to continually take a stand yep. and get bold. I, I grew up as a, a pastor's kid and and everyone that would come into the church, my dad would have them lay hands and pray over me. And so I mean, just dozens and dozens of people over the years. And I want to do that to the people that follow and on this spiritual journey of spiritual leadership, mm. where spiritual leaders like you can pray over people. And I want you to pray a few things. I want you to pray um, for discernment on them. 
I want you to pray against fear. And then that same that same boldness and courage that you walk in, pray it would go upon them. And then as people are listening, whether you're in the car or sitting down watching or you're in, in you know on the run, I want you to posture your hearts to really receive because there's moments like this. I, I, I give people this advice all the time to get impartation. Have people that walk in things that you're believing for pray and impart it into you. And so as people are listening, I'm encourage you to posture your heart to receive. And would you just pray that prayer of yes. impartation over the people? So Holy Spirit, um, with anyone who's listening right now, God, I pray that you would overwhelm them with what you overwhelm me with on a daily basis on that house floor. What I pray for consistently is a reverent fear of you. God, we know that when your Holy Spirit gives us a fear of God, fear of man has to die. There's not enough room in the one heart for a fear of man and fear of God to coexist. And so, Holy Spirit, I pray for a radical passion for justice, a radical passion for truth. Father, we pray that you would realign hearts away from political commitments and, and political, uh, y- y- you know, uh, courageous moments where we've said, oh, that politician is who we're striving to be. God, remove um, remove our loyalty to a party and put it back on the truth in the scriptures. Holy Spirit, I pray that those that are listening that are far unqualified from what man says that they're supposed to be in order to step into a realm, even if it's just to speak truth, Jesus, I pray that you would um, begin to ignite the same flame you put in me when I was on my knees in my living room. And you, you told me so clearly, you're not looking for people with their ears to the ground, but you're list, you're looking for people with their ears to the clouds. In other words, we don't need to be up on the latest cultural trend. We don't need them to understand every level of government. We just need them to hear you and obey. Father, I pray right now you would redefine success in every person who's listening right now that success is not victory in man's eyes. Success is obedience in the name of Jesus. And God, I pray for every elected official that will hear this. And I pray that you would remove the fear of losing their next election. Because God, if you place them there and they lose their next election, then you were done with them there. God, I pray that a fear of God would overwhelm every motive we have. And, And Lord, I pray right now that you're going to give divine wisdom that would make those who do not carry you look like fools in the public square. God, I pray right now that you would Give us the discipline to know when to fight, the courage to stand up, and God, not to make unwholesome deals of compromise when it sounds good, but isn't God. God, give us the courage to take that first step, whether it's running for office, whether it's speaking up, whether it's getting engaged or getting involved. And I pray that all fear of inadequacy has to go and Holy Spirit has to come now. In the name of Jesus, I pray. Amen. Amen. The goal of the Spiritual Leadership Podcast is that you will spiritually grow. With every episode released, you'll be equipped with a leadership guide. In every guide, we will review the information that was covered, reflect by asking questions to yourself, to God and your teams, and apply what you've learned. It's gonna be short, sweet, effective, and to the point. I don't want you just to listen to this podcast. I want you to be able to immediately apply it to yourself and the people you lead. So text PODCAST to 59090 and download the Leadership Guide with every podcast episode we drop. If you desire to spiritually grow, I want to invite you to join me on this journey and subscribe to Mercy Culture. You could also follow me on social at at Landon A. Shot. And if you value this content, I would really appreciate if you would share this with a friend. I'm Landon Shot. Thank you for joining me on Spiritual Leadership, where we're helping leaders become spiritual leaders.